Hello, bonjour. Good afternoon to everyone at home. Welcome from the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Bonjour et bienvenue de la part du Musée canadien pour le droit de la personne à Winnipeg, au Manitoba. Thank you for joining us for this important conversation about the right to housing in Canada today. I'm Angeliki Boyatzi and I'm an interpretive program developer with the Indigenous Relations and Community Engagement team at the museum. Je suis Angeliki Boyatzi, conceptrice de programme d'interprétation ici au musée. Before we begin the program, I would like to share with you the language and accessibility features available in this program. Avant de commencer, j'aimerais vous informer des fonctions de langue et d'accessibilité que nous offrons pour ce programme. The presentations today will be in English. To access French or English simultaneous interpretation, select the circular globe icon in the Zoom controls at the bottom of the Zoom window. Les présentations d'aujourd'hui seront en anglais. Pour accéder à l'interprétation simultanée en français ou anglais, sélectionnez l'icône de globe dans la commande Zoom au bas de votre écran Zoom. As you may have noticed already, we also have ASL interpretation available for this program. To view the ASL interpreters, click View Options in the top right corner and then select Gallery View. We also have both English and French captioning. You can access captioning by following the directions in the chat section. Nous offrons également des sous-titres en anglais et en français. Vous pouvez accéder au sous-titrage en suivant les directives dans la zone de discussion. The Canadian Museum for Human Rights is located on indigenous ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory. The Red River Valley is also the birthplace of the Métis. We acknowledge that the water in the museum comes from Shaw Lake and are grateful to the First Nations that care for that water. The museum is committed to reconciliation, which begins with our acknowledgement that Canada committed genocide against Indigenous peoples. The Indian residential school system is a key component of the genocide, but we also acknowledge acts of genocide against thousands of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls and two SLGBTQIA peoples, and we will continue to bring these stories to light in our work at the museum. At CMHR, we are committed to engaging our audiences in respectful dialogue by providing a safe space for all. We welcome your participation with questions and comments. We ask that you stay on topic and be respectful of others as if you were having a face-to-face -face discussion. Thank you for respecting the rights, differences and opinions of others. You can use the Q&A section to send your questions for our speakers and the moderator. It will be open during the presentation and the Q&A portion of the program. It is a privilege to connect with you today for our virtual panel discussion, Housing is a Human Right, New Actions to Solve Canada's Ongoing Crisis. I'm so pleased to welcome Zina Simsis and Simon Rapkin, our partners in this work, and invite them to say a few words shortly. Zina Simsis' keen interest in human rights has extended over many years. She has been involved in organizing election human rights with the Atlantic Human Rights Center in Fredericton, New Brunswick for more than three decades. She has also dedicated many years to addressing issues of hatred and prejudice as a leader with the Canadian Jewish Congress in British Columbia and with the National Committee. Dr. Sam Ramkin devoted some of his early career as a physician to providing health care in underserviced areas in the North and Kenya, experiences that foster a lifelong commitment to equity and diversity. He has worked to advance the cause of human rights in various committees in both the private and public sectors. Before we begin, Simon and I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations of the Coast Salish peoples. We would like to welcome you to the fifth annual Simpsons and Rapkin Family Dialogue on Human Rights in partnership with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and Equitas. Special gratitude goes to the Canadian Museum for Human Rights for being such a devoted partner and our heartful thanks to Angeliki Boyatzi, Leslie Vrenhoek, and Lindsay Affleck, and all the members of the team at the museum. 
This is our second annual year partnering with Equitas, which is an international center for human rights education. Thank you to Angie Osachaw for your support of this event and for the amazing work you are doing in BC to educate young people on human rights. He established this dialogue to enhance understanding and create an opportunity for conversation on current human rights issues that are impacting us as a community and as a society with the hope of generating positive actions. We have moved to a virtual format to be able to reach a wider audience across Canada. Today's topic on the right to housing is critical. A recent poll in Vancouver indicates that 48% of respondents identify housing as a top priority. Many individuals, diverse groups, and communities right across our country are experiencing the lack of housing, inadequate housing, discrimination, evictions, affordability issues, homelessness, and increased encampments. We have legislation in Canada, a National Housing Strategy Act, that enshrines housing as a human right. But what does this actually mean? Why is housing being treated as a commodity and not as a social good and a legal right? What can be done to make a difference? There is good evidence that people dealing with inadequate housing confront a wide range of adverse health consequences, such as poor mental health, lung disease, and various infectious diseases, to name a few. As a physician, I see these health consequences specifically poor cardiometabolic health, including higher prevalences and poor control of conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, and heart failure. I also recognize the increase in acute healthcare utilization. Acute healthcare utilization encompasses increased hospital admissions, longer hospital stays, and higher readmission rates within 30 days of discharge for individuals with inadequate or unstable housing. Further data indicates that death rates of the homeless in North America are three to five times greater than in the general population. Cardiovascular diseases are a major cause of death in homeless adults between 25 and 64 years of age and are three times more common in the homeless than in an aged match general population. We have a very knowledgeable panel with research expertise and lived experience to discuss how and why we are not meeting the basic right to housing and the consequences of not being able to live in safety and dignity in a decent home. Importantly, they have identified some innovative solutions for action. We are privileged to have guiding our dialogue, Michael Redhead Champagne, Michael is a community leader from Winnipeg's North End, where Zena and I grew up. Michael has family roots in Shamatawa First Nation. He is an author, on-screen personality, and sought-after public speaker. Michael is a staunch activist and advocate working to eliminate poverty and end homelessness and increase support for children, youth, and families. He is also committed to Indigenous knowledge, culture, and language. Over to you, Michael. Tanse, everybody, and thank you so much for the beautiful introduction and for welcoming all of us here for such an important conversation. My name is Michael Redhead Champagne. They call me North End MC. They named me after my neighborhood. Um, but as a helper and an activist uh, advocate, I'm working as hard as I can in Winnipeg and beyond to support uh, the dream of ending homelessness so that every single person in our community and every single person in our country will be able to have access to housing as a human right. And so I'd like to welcome all of you to Housing is a Human Right, New Actions to Solve Canada's Ongoing Crisis. This conversation will give all of us the opportunity to listen to some folks that are on the front lines and innovating as it pertains to applying housing as a human right. It's important for all of us to think about 
I just want to set the stage here for a second. I want us all to just take three deep breaths, okay? In through your nose and out through your mouth. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, and breathe out. Breathe in, and breathe out. Now, what I'd like you to do is appreciate a couple of things with me, all right? Do you have a roof over your head right now? We appreciate that. Are you warm? We appreciate that. Are you fed? We appreciate that. Are you safe? We appreciate that. And so I wanted us to begin our time together, having a couple of breaths and beginning in gratitude because it reminds us of the simple things that everybody needs. And even though we are going to be talking about some of the complexities as it pertains to housing in our country, I want us all to remember the simple activity that we just did. Because yes, these challenges are difficult, but sometimes the solutions have the possibility of being more simple than we ever imagined. So uh, today, you're not only going to be hanging out with me, I'm very honored that today we are going to be hearing from a number of extremely passionate and knowledgeable folks that are going to be sharing with us. So the way that things are going to go today is after I finish introducing the day, uh, we're going to move into a moderated uh, panel discussion and we're going to hear the bulk of our time listening to these experts that I'm about to introduce. Following that, we are going to have time for question and answer. You should notice on the bottom of your screen, there are different buttons that you can engage with. One of them says Q&A. I want you to use that button as folks are presenting. Um, we have a beautiful team of people at the CMHR that are gonna be compiling those questions, feeding them back to me so that I can ask them to the audience. So please don't be shy and you don't have to wait to ask your question. You can get that in as soon as the question formulates in your mind and you get it off your fingertips. So um, once we have our question and answer session, um, we will have a little bit of closing remarks before we uh, wrap up our time together. So what I'd like to do now is simply introduce our panelists. So first panelist I'd like to introduce is Alexandra Flynn. Alexandra Flynn has uh, numerous areas of expertise, um, including Canada's housing uh, and homelessness crisis has knowledge about government responsibilities as it pertains to housing, and uh, the housing assessment resource tools, the balanced supply of housing node, um, brings together academic and nonprofit community organizations to research responsive and land use practices and the financialization of housing. So we are very lucky to have Alexandra. Alexandra, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. We are so glad to have you. I'd also like to introduce our next panelist, Caitlin Schwann, human rights-based, uh, Caitlin takes a human rights-based approach to housing and homelessness prevention through a women's and gender diverse people lens. Um, their motivation to work in the field of adv advancing housing and justice um, is obvious, and they are going to talk to us a little bit about what has been done and share some perspectives on our current situations and new solutions. Caitlin, welcome. Hi. Thank you so much. So thrilled to be here. We are so pleased to have you. Thank you. Joining these rock stars, we also have Laverne Kelly. Um, Laverne Kelly uh, brings a breadth of experience around overcoming challenges and barriers that youth face when seeking housing um, they have experience working with youth, uh, especially single women and young mothers in the Vancouver East Side, advocating for their right to housing, and has a lot of experience around solutions that work. And the inspiration and hope that they're going to be bringing is already super tangible. So I can't wait for the rest of you to meet her. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Oh, we're so glad to have you. And rounding out our team here, we have... Uh, Simpsons and Rabkin Family Dialogue on Human Rights. We have Zena Simpsons and Dr. Simon Rabkin. These folks, of course, are uh, based out of Vancouver, British Columbia, and are able to take their interest in human rights um, from Atlantic Canada, uh, 
uh, British Columbia nationally and take those experiences and ask ourselves the questions around how can we care for folks that some would call disadvantaged. Um, I would simply call them my relatives. Um, but we are excited to welcome our, our next panelists as well. Question mark. Well, let's get started with the folks that we have here today. Um, and if at any point those folks join, please uh, don't be surprised when an extra square joins and we have these awesome folks to add to the conversation. All right, so let's uh, let's get started here. I know I gave uh, Michael's version of an introduction uh, to each of the folks that are here right now. Um, maybe what I'd like to do is simply uh, ask each of you to quickly quickly, because I know that the breadth of your work is breadth very wide. Um, so let's quickly go around and let's let each of these folks um, introduce themselves in the way uh, that makes the most sense to them before we jump into our first question. So we'll just go in the way we introduce people. We'll start with Alex Etra. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, it's uh, it's such an urgent conversation. I, I quickly glanced at the names of those who are here um, and, you know, some of you are new friends, uh, but the ones that I already know, it's such a rich group of people who are, I know, already engaged with these issues. And um, I'm just so happy that we're, that we're talking about it because it's so, it's such a crisis and we'll get into the details of that. But that's really um, what brings me to it. I'm a professor at UBC Law School. Um, I focus on cities, what are cities and what are their responsibilities, and the issue of housing and homelessness or unhoused populations and how that intersects with the right to housing. It was an issue that found me because of its urgency. So that's what brought me here is the question of what are our governments doing to actually realize the right to housing. Thank you so much, Alexandra. So important. Um, to be asking that question of every level of government. Um, next up, we have Caitlin. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Schwann. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. I use she, her pronouns, um, calling in from traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people. Um, yeah, my work is, is really focused on how to realize the right to housing more broadly, but absolutely in this country. Um, I lead the Women's National Housing and Homelessness Network, and what we're up to is really trying to understand how to prevent and end homelessness for women and gender diverse folks. What does that look like? How do we use the new legislation we have in Canada to make that possible? Um, I had the pleasure of, of working at the United Nations for a number of years, working on uh, the human right to housing with the UN Special Rapporteur. And I just feel like we're at a very critical opportunity, like a crisis and an opportunity. Um, so I would encourage all of us not to waste a crisis and, and see it as the opportunity it is. And this new legislation really provides a map for us moving forward. So very excited to, to get into it. Thank you so much, Caitlin and Laverne. Yes, hello. Um, yes, I'm a child and youth care counselor, and I, I do this work because I believe that every youth deserves a chance. And I also like being that support person to walk along youths in their day to day lives when I'm working with them, just to let them know that they're deserving and um, they're special. I also don't just do this work because I like because I care about youths. I also do this work because I understand where they come from. And I'm basically here today just to be a voice for the youths and speak about the urgency of the right to housing for our youths. Thank you. Thank you all very much for one, for the amazing work that you do, uh, but two, for being here for this important conversation. So, what we'd like to do now is talk about how. A little something, something called the National Housing Strategy has or hasn't impacted our work. Once upon a time in 2019, this thing called the National Housing Strategy came into existence. And when that happened, 
this dream that we all have of housing as a human right maybe got a little bit more legs, question mark. So what I'd like to do is ask um, our panelists, can you let us know how has the national housing strategy impacted your work? And I think we'll just keep the same order. Alexandra, if you're all right, um, after you. Yeah, so the National Housing Strategy Act, which is, um, I, I, there'll probably be a link popped into the, the chat. And if it's not there, I'll add it after I'm done speaking. Um, but this was an act that was passed by the federal government. And it does a couple of really important things. So one of the things that it does is it brings in international law into the Canadian context. So Caitlin is actually the person to talk more about this. That's her area of expertise. Um, but it brings those principles into Canadian law. And it includes a commitment for the federal government to work towards the progressive realization for the right to housing, which is something that is found in public international law. So it does that, super important. The second thing that it does is it introduced the position of the federal housing advocate. And this person, does lots of research on housing need across Canada. Um, so the fact that we have this act and that it's doing those two things has been super important for the work that I do as a professor. Um, it's important because it's a new standard that our legal system can look to for what it means for governments to act in the area of housing. It has meant more and crucial research that's done by the federal government um, it's led to more data because we have terrible data about housing need and, um, you know, information around unhoused populations. It's helped me and my team at the Housing Assessment Resource Tools Project to quantify where housing need exists. So the fact that the federal government passed this act, the fact that it recognized that it has a leadership role to play in housing has been crucial for the work that I do. Thank you so much. We'll move uh, right into Caitlin. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, the National Housing Strategy Act. I, uh, at a personal level, it's had a huge impact. And, and at a national level, in terms of the landscape of housing, it's had a huge impact. Um, I left the United Nations, the work I was doing there, because the National Housing Strategy Act was adopted in Canada. And it was absolutely historic it creates a new legal path for advancing housing affordability and adequacy in Canada. Um, and it's very new, as you said, Michael, 2019 is when we adopted it. So we're really in the infancy in terms of understanding what it looks like and how to use it. Um, but in addition to the really compelling points that, that you articulated, Alex, there's a couple of things that I would say the National Housing Strategy Act does that are really important um, and that has really impacted the work I do. Uh, kind of first of all, the National Housing Strategy Act creates accountability from government to rights holders. Um, and as uh, Alexandra articulated, it's based in international human rights law. And these laws dare to insist on a society that holds everyone equal in dignity and worth. So however far we are from that at any given moment, what international human rights law does is says that's a legitimate aspiration. It's not a utopian one. And the reason we say it's legitimate is because we understand that human rights impose legal obligations on governments and that we can demand accountability through human rights courts, um, through human rights monitoring mechanisms, and through, as Alex mentioned, the federal housing advocate, this new mechanism. So the national housing strategy really makes governments accountable to people across the country, but specifically people whose right to housing has been failed. And because it's based in international human rights law, the standards are actually very high. So for example, in international human rights law, it's not permissible to evict someone into homelessness. But of course, we do this all the time. So it really matters that the National Housing Strategy Act is grounded in international human rights law because of those high standards and the jurisprudence. And 
I think what's also extremely powerful about the National Housing Strategy Act is it puts rights holders at the center. So rights holders are the ones that can articulate what rights violations they're experiencing, but also what is the vision for a right to housing. Um, so what that means kind of concretely is that people who are experiencing homelessness are co-designing policy solutions and they have a right to shape the policies that are affecting them. And so, you know, for, for many of you will be very familiar that the kind of discourse we've been operating in, in the global North and in across North America around homelessness has been a really charitable model focused on individual deficiency, individualized causes. What the NHSA does is orient us from charity to a justice model where we understand that homelessness is a human rights violation. So I would just encourage if any of you are working in the area of housing and homelessness, really look at this legislation and where it can be powerful in your work. Thanks. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, Laverne. Okay, yeah. Um, I, where I work at Watari Counseling and Support Services, I run the YAP yeah Parenting Program which is a rental subsidy program for pregnant and parenting youths. So these youths, they receive up to $450 to help them pay their rent in a market housing anywhere in the lower mainland. And this program is funded through BC Housing. So the youths can receive this funding for up to 18 months and sometimes longer. And um, even though the youths receive this rental subsidy, they still face discrimination from landlords. And I will just like to share a quote from one of the youths. Um, so an example would be the landlord, this is a quote from a landlord. So a youth, she's been living with her partner for a very long time and, the, and she's renting and the lease is in her name. The landlord refuses to deal with her because she's a woman. There is black mold everywhere in her home and mushrooms growing, growing out of the wall. This place is severely needs to get fixed. And when she tries to be nice to the landlord to ask him to fix her home, he says to her partner, you are, you are going to address me, not your wife. So this is just an example of some of the discriminations that the youth or youths face. So, yeah, that's what I have to say for now. Thanks. Thank you so much, Laverne. Cliffhanger, cliffhanger, because all of us are invested now. Okay, so um, thank you all very much for helping get our audience um, all on the same page here together about how that national act changes things for us. Um, would you be able to give us an example of a project or a recommendation that you've worked on that saw success? Let's let's talk victories here. Um, what is something that you have worked on that has uh, either been a recommendation that's been implemented or a project that has seen its vision come to fruition? Um, how do you win, Alexandra? Oh wait, and just quickly before you answer, sorry. Um, I just wanted to let our uh, rel our relatives uh, off the hook. I was introducing a couple of our partners earlier. Um, so just wanted to say to the folks who I was introducing, uh, Zena and Dr. Simon, my apologies. You're not speaking. Uh, you are our value partners, though, and we do appreciate you. So just wanted to clarify that. Um, Alexandra. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very fortunate to work with a lot of community sector organizations. So these are folks that are doing work on the ground um, in tent cities. So I've I've worked with um, various um, unhoused folks and advocates who are in the Crab Park um, encampment in Vancouver on Coast Salish lands. Um, I've also worked on um, a number of initiatives related to tenancy protection. So um, vacancy control, which was introduced in the city of Vancouver that basically capped how much rents could increase between tenancies for those who are living in single room occupancy hotels, which are a kind of rooming house. So I would never take credit for 
the important work that is going on with those organizations, but I've worked alongside them. And to me, those are huge successes. Those are um, those are initiatives that are taking place that are um, that are not just based on survival, which is already a lot. How do you survive in a system where your basic rights to dignity are disrespected? Um, it's about fighting the system and advocating on every level. So for example, the, the SRO Collaborative, which is an organization based in the downtown east side that has worked on vacancy control for 15 years, um, they have worked at every single level to introduce vacancy control and now to fight for its protection in the courts. Um, so I've been very privileged to work on that. And, and my work on what it means to have a right to housing has been very much informed by what I have seen on the ground through those organizations. So that's, I guess, one answer to the question. And then the second is around data, just getting information on how much housing need we have, um, which priority populations need housing, which includes seniors, it includes Indigenous peoples, and single moms. Those are the populations that need housing the most. Um, and we have not had historically good data around that. So I'll pop in a link to the Housing Assessment Resource Tools Project, which can show for every single municipality, you can answer, enter your municipality and see how much housing is needed based on available data. Um, and to me, having that, that information is a necessary foundation for the right to housing. How can we know what we need to do as a community, as governments, if we don't know how different people are impacted? So I'll close there. Caitlin? Yeah, um, absolutely brilliant work that you've done in this area, Alex, include like the heart, the data from heart. If, if folks aren't familiar with it, it is incredibly powerful, both in terms of like federal planning, but municipal, provincial, territorial planning, understanding where the needs are. It's enormously beneficial and helpful for us because the National Housing Strategy Act really commits the government of Canada to progressively realizing the right to housing. That kind of data is absolutely essential for us kind of being able to do that. So I, I just want to put another plug in there for that. Um, in terms of successes, what I wanted to share is something that's meant, I think, a tremendous amount to women and gender diverse folks who are experiencing how to, housing need and homelessness across the country. Um, at the Women's National Housing and Homelessness Network, what we've been doing over the last couple of years is doing a lot of human rights advocacy and organizing. And we brought together a group of about 35 women and gender diverse folks, um, lots of folks with lived expertise, social service providers, kind of grassroots activists, a whole range of folks to talk about what kind of human rights violations are women and gender diverse folks who are unhoused experiencing? What does it look like? And to develop a human rights claim Sorry, my cat's joining us for this, this moment. Off you go. Um, he's also celebrating. Uh, and so we developed this human rights claim, took, took us about six months, and it really kind of meant to articulate the ways in which our current housing system is failing marginalized women and gender diverse folks, and the ways in which it's actually discriminatory. Um, we don't often think about the housing crisis as a gendered crisis, but it really, really is. Um, when you look at the research, we know that, that women and gender diverse folks, especially racialized folks, indigenous folks, LGBTQ2S folks, are more likely to be in core housing need, live in poorer housing, have poorer income, struggle with security of tenure. Um, there's, there's a huge range of data in this area. So the success was this grassroots group pulled together a human rights claim. And we did it alongside our indigenous sisters, the National Indigenous Housing Network. And we submitted these two claims to the federal housing advocate, who is the national watchdog on the human right to housing, as Alex mentioned. And she received submissions from communities, from individuals, from organizations across the country. Um, and what we saw was that she she selected these two claims as 
meriting a national human rights review. Um, so that was announced in the spring. And in 2024, what we will see as a human rights inquiry into the federal government's failure to prevent and end homelessness for women and gender diverse folks, and specifically for indigenous women, two-spirit gender diverse folks. So it was this enormous grassroots effort to bring together research, bring together lived experts, bring together service providers, folks who are really have been struggling for decades and decades to get this understood as a human rights issue, as an equality issue. Um, and so for the first time in Canada, we're going to have a public hearing about this. And the recommendations from this will be seen in the Senate and the House of Commons. And the Minister of Housing under the legislation has to respond in 120 days. So it's a very important moment for kind of the work that we're doing, and this legislation has made it possible. Um, so I would encourage if any of you are working in this area, please uh, check out our work at womenshomelessness.ca. I think my colleague um, put a link to our human rights claim in the chat. Um, but this has been a huge success on our kind of in the areas we're working. Thank you so much. Laverne. Thank you. So yeah, when you when youths know that they have the right to housing, from my experience, they become inspired and gain confidence. I'll share a story with you about a youth that I worked with last year on a community action project through through Equitas. So this youth, her name is Sunshine. So through this group, she learned about her human rights. During this time, she was homeless and was, she was continuously looking for a home for many, many months. Finally, she found a really cute little ground level apartment. Once she moved in, she started decorating her cute little home with plants, wall pictures, furniture, etc. She made it so cozy and she was really happy to invite me over to come see her new, new home. So I noticed her confidence started to grow. She started using her voice to advocate for herself. She gained employment with Watari at our new building that we just opened up because, and she'd also been employed for a very long time. She displayed dignity and pride in herself. And she also filled out applications to get back into school because she wanted to, she want, her goal is to become a youth worker. So we cannot underestimate or undervalue the role that housing plays in a young person's ability to find employment. Um, so, yeah, that's what, that's, that's what I have to say for this one, thanks. Thank you, um, Laverne. So, I'm going to just quickly deviate from the questions that we have prepared for. So apologies in advance to the panelists. Um, there's a comment around uh, housing is a crucial need among refugees and other immigrant groups. Has this impacted? Have you seen this in your work? Everyone doesn't have to answer, but if somebody, anyone wants to. Well, I've definitely seen it um, here in, in Vancouver. I attend a lot of meetings with other youth providers that work with housing and things like that. And there's a huge influx of youths that are coming in looking for housing, trying to find services. Um, yes, there's a huge, a huge number. I would also maybe just add that in Winnipeg, we have a really beautiful model um, called IRPOM, the Immigrant and Refugee Community Organization of Manitoba provides family-based housing folks that are coming to Canada and literally will give them like bigger units if they need to so that grandma can live with the person who's moving in and then the kids get to be there too and then we get that whole intergenerational uh, relationship building plus housing. Um, so uh, the IRCOM model in Winnipeg I think is a good example um, and I've, of what I've seen services wrapping around to take care of, of different relatives and families. So um, the next question that we prepare for, oh, sorry, Caitlin, did you wanna add something? I was just gonna say, I mean, it's incredibly critical 
to understand that the homelessness sector, when folks who are coming to Canada as refugees, as asylum seekers, as newcomers, and they're struggling tremendously to pay rent in enormously overheated housing markets, if they fall into homelessness in many major cities, they're also showing up at the doors of homeless shelters that have zero capacity to accommodate them. Um, they're showing up with not necessarily the language skills, the knowledge of how the system works. Like if you're a resident of a city for many years and experience homelessness, it is enormously challenging to try to figure out the networks of resources or housing or supports that might be there, even if you know the city extremely well. Like if you were a newcomer or asylum seeker, it is impossible to overstate the enormity of the challenges you face in trying to, to navigate that system, in addition to the settlement process, in addition to income and trying to remain with your children or multiple generations together. So the National Housing Strategy Act is going to be, I think, an incredibly critical tool for folks who are organizing in that space as well, because folks who come to this country have the right to housing regardless of their immigration status. And so this, as a framework, protects these folks as well and needs to be part of how we plan for settlement um, and how we think about policy development around settlement as well. Can I just throw something in there too, just to build on what Caitlin said? Um, so part, part of our big struggle in Canada is that we have three levels of government and each one of them points their finger at the other to say that they're exactly, that they're the ones who are meant to be uh, addressing the problem. Um, and we saw this play out, we see this play out across the country, but in Toronto, for example, Mayor Chow recently said, you know, immigration is a federal responsibility and the federal government needs to house <coughs> newcomers that are coming the city just can't do it. We don't have the capacity to address the issue. And as Caitlin said, that's unfortunately not an adequate response. People who are coming need a place to stay and all governments need to be working together to solve the problem. And in absence of all governments working together, in my view, the federal government needs to step up and show leadership. They've already shown leadership through the introduction of this act, which is great. Um, but they also need to show leadership in areas that are so obviously um, its responsibility, such as immigration and refugee status and what happens with folks who are coming that don't have housing. Um, you know, cities cannot address this on their own. It's just not possible. Um, so we need the federal government to be showing up, to be taking um, a leadership role and not to be stepping backwards and pointing fingers. Thank you so much. So I feel like I have a million questions I want to keep keep asking. I won't because we are running out of time. So I'm going to move to our last prepared question before our formal Q&A, although we've been doing pretty good answering the Q&As as we go. Um, so uh, our next question here is, what action do you want viewers, the people that are on this call with us here today, what action do you want those participants to take? Because what do we have? 220. We have over 200 people on the call right now. So if you had a magic wand and you could act, you could provide an action to these 200 plus helpers that are here with us today, what would your call to action be? Um, so the fact that you're here is already fantastic. I mean, you care, obviously, about this issue. So that's a huge thing. Um, you know, find out what the right to housing means in your community. Find out who's doing important work in this area. Um, there's issues that come up all the time that relate to the adequacy of housing, that relate to tent cities and the, the you know, the, what's happening to folks who don't have secure housing. Um, so, for example, um, where I live it, on Coast Salish lands in Vancouver, um, the British Columbia government has recently introduced a bill that would seek to define what shelter means. Um, and this bill um, doesn't um, 
actually meet constitutional standards that have been won through the courts. And so numerous people have come forward, Indigenous leaders, um, municipal leaders, other advocates, lawyers, academics, to push back against the government and to say that that is not the kind of solution that we're looking for. We're looking for adequate housing to address the problem, not more controls around public space. Um, we're not going to solve the, the crisis of a lack of affordable housing by, you know, pushing people away from tent cities. That's not going to fix it. We need adequate housing. And so the more that you can pay attention to what's going on, um, reach out to elected officials. I promise you it makes a huge difference when you sign petitions, when you show up at city council chambers and speak against something. It's hard to do that. We all have busy lives, but it makes a big difference. Um, and best of all, we need really good leaders um, run for leadership positions. Um, we need people who care about this issue um, at the forefront of decision making. Um, so that's my call to action. Just do more of what you're already doing by caring and showing up and being heard. Thank you very much. Great call to action. I'm getting hyped up. Caitlin. I'm I'm going to kind of double down on on what Alex is saying here. Like, it is you should not underestimate the power of like community voices to shape policy responses to housing and homelessness. Like it it may seem like you're just sending a letter or or you know looking at a particular policy in your community and and speaking to a political leader about it. That stuff is incredibly powerful, and the reason. Part of the reason I say that is because part of the work I've been doing over the last couple of years has been focused on the right to housing for people who are living in encampments or tent communities, as my colleague at the National Indigenous Housing Network frames them. And folks who are living in encampments have a right to housing, and they have a whole set of rights that the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing has articulated in a, a document that'll be dropped in the chat. And so this is actually a very critical right to housing issue that's happening across the across the country and that I know probably many of you are are engaged about or thinking about because it's visible in a way it hasn't been before. And it's incredibly important and powerful for folks in community to be ensuring that their municipal government, provincial territorial government, understands that people who are living unsheltered, people who are living in tent communities have a right to housing um, and they have a set of human rights and that all policy responses to tent communities need to be understood in that framework. So international human rights law doesn't enable cities to destroy encampments because they you know, tarnish the beauty of the downtown or because they obstruct uh, a pathway in a park. The human right to survive eclipses that. And what we've seen in cities across the country is when communities speak up in support and in solidarity with people who are unhoused in their community, when they speak up about encampment evictions, without due process or encampment evictions that violate human rights. It's very much the case that we've seen multiple successes uh, in these areas. There's a growing body of jurisprudence in this area. Um, in the city of Barrie, near where I live, for example, there was a proposed bylaw that would criminalize the provision of water, food, any other kind of basic necessities for people who are unhoused. Um, up to a fine of $100,000. So this was a proposed bylaw. There was enormous outrage about it. And because of that community response, it didn't even go to a vote. The city rescinded it. And so do not underestimate the power of your voice in this space. Um, the National Housing Strategy Act applies to all levels of government. There's really a need to make that clear and to help government understand that. I think in the work that I've done, um, it's been, if you are in government 
for folks on the call who are in government, understand if you're working in the area of housing, you are working in the area of, of human rights. Um, and that is like a deep, deep, deep responsibility. Um, and you have law to help guide you in that work. And you can be doing really important internal advocacy within your government using those laws and standards. Um, but again, just, just kind of ex echoing Alexandra here, we're at a really important moment. We have this new legislation. We need to make it work. It requires us kind of grabbing a hold of it and making use of it um, and ensuring and defending it and defending the rights of people who are unhoused. And that is a shared responsibility. And I would say it's also a shared responsibility that's really linked to our shared commitment to truth and reconciliation, because this is absolutely an issue that is inseparable from justice for Indigenous folks uh, across the country and across Turtle Island. So thank you very much. I'll stop there. Okay. I'd like to share to I'd like to share a call to action for decision makers and allies who can support youth to exercise their right to housing to advocate and be a voice and support our youths. Also, if you have friends that are landlords, or if you are a landlord, please teach, please teach them about the discriminations that our youths face and be kind to them. Give them a chance by acknowledging and respecting and removing the barriers for them to realize their human right to housing. Because people have this inclination, some people have this inclination that, or belief, that all youths are housed and that there are lots of supports out there for them. Well, this is not the case. We know housing is difficult for even the average person. Can you imagine how hard it is for youth to find housing with all the barriers that they face just by being a youth? So we need to support our youth by advocating for their right to housing. These are the things that I'm doing and I would like you to help me do this as well. Thank you, Laverne. And everybody, this has been a really fantastic conversation. And thank you everyone for using the Q&A feature on the bottom of your chat. I'm seeing all the questions coming in and I know we've been able to answer some of them via chat. Uh, the next question that we have is uh, coming from Rita. How do we spur much more affordable housing to be built and protected? How do we spur much more affordable housing to be built and protected? Yeah, I can jump in here. I was just writing a, a reply, so it's perfect timing. Um, I don't think it was a reply to that question, but it's a similar question, um, uh, which is about the commodification of housing, basically. Um, and I think it links into this issue. You know, right now, the way that federal funding and provincial funding programs work for new housing, for affordable housing, is that they rely on the market to fix it. So there's um, funding programs that are introduced that, that ask developers to build a certain percentage of um, affordable housing alongside market housing. Um, there's many fewer grants for nonprofits that are that are building affordable housing and even less for social housing units, which are those that are owned by the government and run long term for those with low incomes. Um, and so changing those programs to identify more support for um, nonprofits and for social housing would be beneficial. It would keep that housing stock for those who really need it. If you look at the heart data, not to keep endlessly plugging the heart data, but if you look at it, you'll see that the housing need that we have in Canada is mostly low income and very low income people. That's who needs house housing. We don't need much more market housing like condos being built that are being sold to upper middle class people. We need low income housing. That's who needs it. And so funding programs should match where the housing need is. So that's one answer to the question. And then the other answer to the question is around housing controls. There's lots of things government can do that don't cost any money to introduce. So for example, having rent control, 
um, rent control protects the price of housing units. It keeps the price low. So right now, when a tenant vacates a unit, the landlord can charge whatever the market will bear. And in some communities, that's more than 20 or 25%. The difference in rent from one person when they leave to the next is a huge increase in charges. So that just makes it even more unaffordable. Um, and so those are, you know, tenancy protections having, you know, most, uh, I could go on forever, but the data is showing that, that most evictions are those who are not at fault. You know, we have this idea that people who are being evicted aren't paying their rent or aren't paying their utilities, but actually the people who are, are getting evicted are those who, where the landlord is taking over the unit for themselves, or maybe in some cases, renting that unit for more money because the market will bear it because we don't have enough housing supply. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Um, as you can tell, I am used to lecturing, um, but I will stop. Um, and pass it on to my wonderful panelists to have their answer to the question. Yeah, I'll jump in here too. Um, so what the federal government has done, we have the National Housing Strategy Act. Before that, in 2017, we have the National Housing Strategy. This is an $82 billion or 82 probably plus billion dollar investment. And it was it signals kind of the re-entry of the federal government into the housing sphere. And what Alex articulated is absolutely the case. In a, a large majority of where we're directing program funds is to the development of housing that is not going to meet the needs of folks who are in very low or low income. So folks that have kind of a maximum of 1000 1050 to spend a month. A majority of where we're spending federal dollars in terms of the development of housing is in middle class or slightly lower housing development. So for example, the rental construction financing initiative, this is a program that it's a huge investment at the federal level, about 40% of the national housing strategy. But the affordability criteria are really weak and they're really quite small. So if you're a developer and you want to benefit from this program, only 10% of your units need to be affordable. They only need to be affordable for 10 years. And they only need to be at 30% of median income for the area. Um, and we know that in most cities across the country, that's going to be completely unaffordable for folks who are on social assistance of any kind or who are in deep core housing need. So the point here is that the federal legislation, as it's written, requires us to focus on those in greatest need. That's what international human rights law says. You, you don't just build any kind of housing and hope it's going to trickle down. You have an, a legal obligation to focus on addressing those who are in greatest core housing need first. We're not currently doing this at the federal level. So what would enormously help us is if we aligned the national housing strategy with these international human rights norms that we see in the NHSA. We need to kind of have an audit of where we're spending existing dollars in order to understand why we're not getting the kind of outcomes we hope to in terms of actually seeing a reduction in, in core housing need. So that's one piece. The second piece um, is we just need to vastly invest in social housing um, compared to other G7 nations or OECD countries uh, around the world. We have some of the lowest stock of social housing. Um, so in Canada, about 3.5% of the housing stock is social housing compared to 16, 17% in the UK, for example, or 7.5% or across the EU. If the countries that have been very successful at reducing core housing need, reducing homelessness have invested extremely significantly in social housing and they've continued with those investments. So I feel like if we were to do these two pieces, it would be incredibly powerful in terms of addressing 
uh, housing affordability across the country. Okay, well, that's a really great question, Michael. I think my fellow, fellow panelists did an excellent job answering it. So back to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Laverne. Maybe I'll just, I see a comment uh, that I maybe cut you off earlier when you were talking about um, newcomer uh, housing. And I just wanted to apologize for that. And uh, I'd say, if you would like to finish your thoughts, you're welcome to. Um, no, I think I said it all. That was fine. Okay, just check in. Yes, thank you. All right. So I, we do have another uh, question coming up. Um, I just have to add my two cents. You guys picked the worst moderator. I'm the most talkative moderator ever. Mm -hmm. So um, in Winnipeg, again, back to Winnipeg, um, we have a lot of Indigenous people represented in housing. And for me, as somebody that has that lived experience in housing, uh, insecurity in my past, um, and a lot of my relatives are struggling with homelessness right now, um, it's really important for us to provide the supports that we can, moving people where they're at. Um, and so um, one of the projects that we're working on right now is with Raising the Roof, and it's um, called the Reside Project. And what we're going to be doing is getting an old nail salon and converting it into um, housing for parents that are bringing their children home from child and family services. They're reunifying. Um, but not only will there be a three bedroom and a four bedroom unit for that, um, there will also be a suite for a young person aging out of care, doesn't have connection to family, and we'll treat that kind of whole housing unit as a kinship unit. And so they'll all be the aunties and the uncles and the cousins and the nephews and the nieces uh, that we need um, in that one housing unit. So that's integrating Indigenous um, knowledge into housing. And I think uh, just a note on, we mentioned it earlier, just a note on terminology, right? Um, I always use family and kinship-based language when I'm talking about our relatives who are struggling um, with homelessness because I want to define them by what they have. I call them our relatives because what do they have a family? Um, and if they don't have a family, people can get a family of choice. And I think that's what we're all doing here as helpers. We're choosing to be the family of our relatives um, that are struggling. So uh, back to the questions uh, that have been asked in the chat. Um, do you think the introduction of NHSA has given us an opportunity to advance the concept of intersectional? human rights in Canada? And is it actually happening? Because I am not just an Indigenous person, I am many, many, many different identities. And so how how is that intersectionality um, impacting the work you do? Is it really happening? Alexandra? Yeah. Um... Yes, it is. And I think I think the reason why the rights framework is so meaningful is because we we know that there's other rights that exist, right? Like we have the right not to be discriminated against under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, so that those are equality rights. We have the rights to life, liberty, and security of the person, basically basic dignities. Um, there are Aboriginal and Indigenous rights that exist in this country. And all of those rights are part of what it means to have a right to housing. We know intuitively, and those who are working on the ground know this even better, that when you're talking about who needs that right, who needs to exercise that right, it's, um, it's historically marginalized and vulnerable people who need, who need that right to housing to be uh, to be protected. Um, and so I do think that the right to housing gives us a lens to think about intersectionality, because it's not just about, um, you know, a right to buy a home. It's a, it's the most, it's like how you started, Michael, the whole conversation, being conscious of having four walls and a ceiling. Um, you know, I know growing up, I, I was precariously housed. I didn't always have that sense that I was going to be living um, in my home on a, you know, even a medium term basis or a short term basis, it's very scary. Um, and so those are the kinds of rights that we mean. And that implies like, who is, 
who's affected by them, paying attention to that. So I do think so. I'm actually, not that I don't want to hear Caitlin's answer, but I really want to hear Laverne's answer because I feel like you've raised so many things so far about um, intersectionality and about how that looks on the ground. I'll come back to, thank you for that. I'll come back to your um, comment, but I just want to, um, Michael, your example that you spoke about earlier was just so important. And I like to speak to that. Um, I just want to share my personal story. So I was a ward of Children's Aid Society when I, from when I was 13 years old in Winnipeg. And um, I remember having a really cool social worker at the time who told me that Laverne, you are really special and you can do and be anything that you want to be in, the, in this world. So I ended up um, being homeless, couch surfing, staying at friend's house, traveling throughout Canada. And once I turned 18, which meant I was no longer a ward of the government, I came back to Winnipeg and I got my grade 10. And then moving forward, when I turned 23, I moved out to Vancouver and I went to Douglas College, obtained my community social service worker diploma, had two, two little two children, ended up doing a lot of volunteering in the community. And I received my social service worker diploma from Douglas College. And I ended up working for Elizabeth Fry Society in a shelter. And from there, I went to Douglas College and got my child and youth care degree program and um, ended up working in various youth services. And finally, I ended up at Watari. But what I want to say is um, I people... People and support systems in the community didn't turn their back on me. I had a lot of supports from different organizations. And um, that a lot of that has turned me into the person that I am today. And then, yeah, that's what I want to share. Thank you. David? Yeah, Laverne, that's... So powerful. Your voice is so critical in this conversation. And like, I think when we're talking about failures of the right to housing, we're also talking about a bunch of other public system failures, including the child welfare system. Um, and so it's an amazing question. It's an incredibly important question, this question around intersectionality, because there's two pieces to it. There's the ways in which all human rights are necessarily integrated and co-constitutive and need to be understood together. Um, so if I'm having my agency and dignity violated in my employment setting, in healthcare setting, as someone, if you're a person who has disabilities, you're experiencing barriers to education or employment, all of that absolutely impacts your housing, your ability to secure and maintain housing. And so, when I think, I guess, about a vision for a housing justice movement, I see it as very much deeply integrated with a whole range of justice and equity seeking movements that are happening across the country. So the great thing about human rights law is it understands it very holistically. It understands the ways in which these human rights pieces fit together. And it also understands that, and what is articulated in the National Housing Strategy Act, is this focus on folks in greatest need. And it's usually folks who are at the intersection of a whole bunch of systematic forms of discrimination, of exclusion, of public system failures. And putting those two kind of intersections together and understanding that building towards a path towards housing justice necessarily involves seeking justice in other public systems as well, such as the child welfare system. So that was a bit rambly, but I, I just, it's, a, it's an incredibly important question. I think that the NHSA provi provides an important framework, but there's a lot of work for us to be doing, for example, as we're thinking about how does the National Housing Strategy Act articulate with UNDRIP? How does it articulate with, with other kinds of movements that are happening across the country? Um, that are seeking for justice and inclusion. So yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks. 
So as we examine all of the complexities of the folks that we are serving, it has become clear from your most recent answers that we are all coming at this from a place of um, lived experience, but also from a place of long-term strategy. And so I, I love that we have both of those in harmony with one another in our presentation today. Um, I would ask, we have uh, maybe enough time for one more go around each um, from each of our, our guests here today. And maybe what I'll do is as much as we have 33 questions that we could be answering, um, I think what I'd really like to do now is simply invite um, Alexandra, Caitlin, and Laverne to share any thoughts that they have not been able to share with us yet that they feel like our participants need to hear um, before we finish. Um, the one thing that I will say um, is that uh, we've been dancing around it, but it sounds like we're talking a lot about integrating and injecting love into a system that does not, um, you know, the legal system is not known for being loving. Um, but what we're talking about when we you know, recognize people for who they are. And we, you know, recognize housing as a human right. I think this really puts us on the path that we want to be on. So is there anything else that we haven't yet shared? Anything else that you want our participants to go away? This is your last, uh, last share. We'll start with Alexandra. I feel kind of bad that I always get to start, but um, okay, I'm going to do two things. So number one is I want to end on a positive note by talking about leadership that we're seeing and how it's helping. Um, and especially leadership that is taking place at the municipal scale. Um, so right now in the city of Toronto, the mayor has pushed and forced really the federal government and the provincial government to the table. And it said, you know, you're not creating the framework, so we have to. And Toronto is a big enough city that they can do it. They're the fourth largest city in Canada. So they're like the size of a province, right? They can force all the governments to the table under uh, the, I think it's called the New Deal is, is the, the term that they're using. And that's really important to have all these governments showing up. And the fact that the municipality is forcing it um, is forcing housing and shelters and encampments and all of these critical issues that we're talking about today to be dealt with together um, is, is a huge boon. So that's one. Another example is what's taking place in the city of London, where they have adopted a human rights lens for how people in tent cities are going to be treated. Um, and they're implementing the protocol which um, Caitlin and Leilani Farha drafted um, as guidance for how people in the encampment are going to be treated. That is huge. It's hard and it's huge. I saw some comments here about, you know, frustrations with a municipality that isn't doing that. Um, and it can, it, you know, it's not a long-term solution. Nobody wants people to be sleeping outside and to be so precarious. But in the absence of housing for what people need, this is a step that municipalities can take that is going to make a big difference. So those are just two examples of things that are taking place on the ground that are making a big difference. Um, and I guess I also just wanna close by saying that there's so much expertise and knowledge in this audience. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out if, if there's anything that I can do or if I can help connect you. I, you know, we're, we're a big country, but we're a small country. And this is a, a, a you know, this takes, us working together in as much as we can, sharing resources, sharing successes. So please don't hesitate to reach out if there's any anything that I can do going forward. Thank you so much, Caitlin. That's lovely. I might invert the order as well. Laverne, do you do you want to do you have thoughts you want to share first before we? Yeah, I do. I like to to share the iceberg theory that I, I learned about this in college a while ago when it comes to housing for youths. When basic needs are met, one can succeed. For example, housing is connected to well-being. So when a youth is housed, they have a stronger sense of safety and belonging. They can build roots, networks, friends, neighbors, 
They have more confidence in seeking, in seeking employment because they have stable housing. And it's not just about finding housing, it's about maintaining and keeping housing. And this will add to their well being, their health. Ah, so brilliant, Laverne. That's that's lovely. Um, yeah, I oh, I have so many thoughts here. The first one, thank you so much, Michael, for raising love. Uh, that is a beautiful thing that we don't always talk about in housing policy at all, or I shouldn't don't always. We often don't, or almost never talk about. And something I think about a lot in the work we do is like the concept of dignity and this really roots us in what human rights are about and I had the opportunity um, a couple of months ago to go out on um, with the street medicine team across LA uh, and meet with folks who are living unsheltered and I met a woman um, named Takesha who had been living on the streets for about 20 years um, she was living in a wheelchair in under a tarp uh, on the cement um, and she wasn't able to move her wheelchair. Uh, she um, accesses water through the fire hydrant that's in front of her. Um, and she uses a plastic bag to toilet herself that is attached to her wheelchair. And I had a conversation, a very long conversation with Takesha, who encouraged me to share the reality that she's facing. And this is in LA. This is, this is not in Canada. But she described huge indignities that she faced in long-term care homes and in healthcare settings. And she said, I'd rather live out here with some dignity than ever go back to what I was experiencing there. And I like think about it every day. I think about her every day. And I think about, we need to build a society that affirms people's agency and dignity in housing and in all public systems. Because when I met Takesha, from my perspective, the kind of indignities she was living through daily were so profound. But for her, they, they were a space of greater dignity than being in a healthcare system that she had engaged with through long-term care. And so I, would, I guess I would just encourage all of us to really dig deep in terms of what we mean when we say di dignity, what we mean when we say housing, um, the things we want for ourselves and we want to ensure for all folks. We live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Um, homelessness compared to other problems, like for example, developing a very complex vaccine is, is not a very complicated problem. We know that housing and support solve homelessness. Um, and we imminently have the finances as a country to solve the problem. It's entirely possible. And I would encourage all of us to also not believe the narrative that this problem is not solvable, that it's too complex, we just can't get there. It is not true. It is absolutely not true. And there are countries like Finland, like others around the world who have eradicated homelessness. And again, not through tremendously complex initiatives that we can never understand. Um, there are roadmaps around the world that, that we can be drawing on as a nation. We have the resources and, and we have the capacity to kind of build a really dignified world for us to live in. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining us for this conversation and thank, thank you so much, Michael. Wow, wow. Well, on behalf of all of our participants, Alexandra, Caitlin, Laverne, you have filled my heart and my brain. And so now uh, I gotta roll up my sleeves and we gotta get to work, right? So uh, thank you all very much for what you shared with us here today. Um, housing is a human right. Housing is a human right. Housing is a human right. I'm just going to keep saying it. Um, but uh, thank you all very much for what you've shared with us. Um, to close us off today, actually, I'm going to hand it over to um, Angie from Equitas to give us some closing remarks. So let's give our virtual square love to Angie. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for being here. 
Thank you so much, Michael, and, and thank you to everyone. It has been a real pleasure to listen to the conversation today. Um, I was thinking about what I was hearing and I was really inspired. And I hope that everyone else felt inspired and felt motivated. On behalf of Equitas, the International Center for Human Rights Education, I really want to take a moment to thank everybody who participated in the panel and joined us in the panel today. I wanna to thank Michael, as our wonderful charismatic moderator and our three panelists, Alexandra, Laverne and Caitlin. You brought together a breadth of knowledge and experiences, your passion for the right to housing and for supporting our communities to be our best selves, to reach our full potential and to support everybody is really inspiring and I took note of it all. I heard some amazing points while you were speaking. I heard, you know, when we started off with uh, Zena and Simon, who really reinforced the importance of the right to housing, and Simon brought in a healthcare lens. Why does housing impact our well-being from a health perspective? And then we moved to our panelists who spoke about um, the National Housing Strategy Act and the kind of impact it's having. They reinforced the value of having housing articulated as a right to housing and some of the actions that are being taken and can be taken. Laverne brought forward the perspective and the voices of young people who are facing barriers to housing and helped bring the value of the National Housing Strategy Act forward, but also uh, reinforce some of the changes that can continue to be made. And so deep gratitude. And they ended with some calls to action. And I heard things about how it impacts all of us, how it impacts different generations, how it impacts newcomers, how it impacts indigenous people specifically. And they asked us all to pay attention to the right to housing as an important issue affecting our communities, to reach out and to take time to learn more, to engage in dialogues with our decision makers and our policymakers in our communities, and to step forward and take action if you can. You know, Laverne specifically said, if you're a landlord, think about this differently. If you know people who are landlords, talk to them about this. And so with everything that they said, there are uh, beautiful calls to action that I think we all need to, to reinforce. And then Michael ended with this idea of love. And I think if we are trying to cultivate communities where people thrive, where people are loved, we need to recognize the importance of dignity, which is something that Alexandra and both Laverne referenced. So let's build communities that are founded on ensuring that everyone has dignity and through that dignity, we can all have love. So I'd like to thank Zena and Simon uh, for being the inspirations also behind our annual human rights dialogue for inviting Equitas and myself to participate in this conversation and for really recognizing the importance of having conversations about the human rights issues that are impacting our communities. I wanna thank the museum as well. I know Zina and Simon thanks them, but as well for being amazing partners and uh, facilitating the important conversations that we're having. And finally, I'd like to thank all of the attendees who've joined us today. I've been reading your questions, your comments, your passion, and your personal connections to the stories in the Q&A uh, section. And I feel so privileged that you've taken time out of your day to join us in this conversation, and that many of you took the time to write your ideas, your questions, and your comments in the Q&A. I wish all of us continued strength as we move forward to try to tackle some of the human rights issues that are impacting our communities and in particular, the right to housing. So let's think about housing as a human right and let's start taking action so that way together we can solve this ongoing crisis in Canada. Good night, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us.